It was a long day. It was a long day, and um, I hope uh, uh, you found it quite informative, and you learned things about uh, smart contracts, the blockchain, and uh, uh, this emerging area between uh, cryptography and, and law. So um, to finish the day, uh, we thought it would be great to have uh, bring all the speakers back on stage. Um, the, uh, the people that share, shared with you their perspectives about um, their areas and specifically how do those relate to smart contracts and um, have a um, open floor discussion um, about all the topics that were put forth today. Um, and furthermore, think about the future. What is the future of cryptography and law together? So um, before we start a discussion, I would like to uh, welcome our special guest for uh, this discussion panel, which is Charles Hoskinson, uh, sitting there on the far right from your point of view. Um, so uh, Charles is uh, CEO of uh, Input Output HK, uh, which is one of the leading companies now worldwide bringing this uh, blockchain technology for smart contracts from, uh, let's say, the experimental academic uh, um, area to, to the actual real world where people can actually engage with it. So I would like to start uh, this discussion panel with, uh, with a foreword uh, from Charles, um, putting also his perspective, uh, this perspective from someone that works in the industry and tries to make uh, this happen in, in the real world. So uh, Charles, let's start, let's start with you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, brilliant. Well, first, thank you all for coming. I mean, it's uh, Friday. It's always fun to learn about smart contracts and cryptography on your Friday afternoon. You're very special people. Uh, my name is Charles Hoskinson. I uh, actually just came in from Malta yesterday, and I run a company called Input Output. I've probably never heard of our company before, unless you work for us. Actually, we have a few people in the audience who do. Uh, what is Input Output? Well, this is my third cryptocurrency company. Uh, the last two that I, s I started were more like project-based companies where I said, I want to build a cryptocurrency with properties X, Y, and Z. Let's get a cool team of people together. Let's go build something. And then after we're done, we just all kind of go off into the ether and figure out what to do next. I said, well, you know, I love the process. Can I build a company that's like a factory that manufactures cryptocurrencies for private clients, public clients, and so forth, and uh, see what industries we can systematically decentralize, whether that be gambling or whether that be financial products or IoT stuff. So uh, originally this business plan was sketched out in Osaka, Japan, in a diner with my co-founder. Uh, and we were like, yeah, man, we're, we're going to do all this cool stuff, functional programming and all these other things. And somewhere along the way, we realized that most of the science of our field has actually not been written. It's completely new. Uh, so as a consequence, we realized that in addition to founding an engineering company, we actually had to found a research company as well. Uh, so we, we did what all insane entrepreneurs did, and uh, we decided to build a research arm at our company. And it started by hiring some cryptographers and then realizing that we needed to build university partnerships. So now about two years later, we're revenue positive. We actually make a lot of money. We have about 50 employees. We operate in 10 countries. We actually have two research centers. We're just about to open up our third center. One's at Tokyo Tech, and the other center's at University of Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, our research side does first principles research into cryptocurrencies. So we start with the white paper uh, and all the good science, and we take that through peer review, and we work our way all the way to a production implementation that people actually use somewhere along the way. Um, and it turns out that when you build that kind of a pipeline, um, your biggest enemy is actually cynicism, because many of the claims of our industry are untenable or a little far off and very difficult. But also it gives you a tremendous sense of awe and appreciation for the creativity and passion that people have in this space. It really is amazing to see what efforts and projects um, have come about, and uh, that's really exciting. So from an industrial perspective, uh, if any of you are considering starting a business in the space or doing some work in the space, prospects are pretty good. Funding is amazing. A uh, lot of interesting stuff is going on. It's kind of like the dot-com boom. But I will warn you that just like there was a boom with the dot-com specter, there will be a bust. So probably the window to get in early is, is over. And now we're actually getting down to the meat and potatoes of our industry in that people actually have to produce and do real things, which is a lot harder than the theoretical, you can do something like this. So that's kind of the, uh, the forward. Thank you all for coming. And I look forward to having a great panel with everyone. Thank you. 
right, so thank you, Charles. And, and, and perhaps, like, uh, since you mentioned that, maybe um, you can share with us, like, there were, like, what are the significant barriers from a legal point of view, like, in this, in this effort? So there was anything that uh, you identified in this uh, course um, of the years that you're working in the area that you feel that regulation was um, basically working against you or working against the technology and uh, you felt that it has to be changed in order for things to happen better or, or to make them work. So is there, is there any example, is there anything that uh, uh, comes to your mind and you, uh, you can share uh, with, with our audience? Right. Well, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. So one of my favorite uh, regulations, historically speaking, is right when the automobile came out, there was a state in the United States this was quite early. It was uh, in the turn of the century, the early uh, 20th century. It said if you were to own an automobile as a, a safety precaution, you had to have somebody stand uh, 10 feet in front of the automobile with a yellow flag, and then they had to have a horse uh, riding behind the automobile in case it broke down so you could tow it. So this was the automobile regulation, state-of-the-art regulation uh, for this emerging technology. Um, so FinTech is, is actually one of the most regulated industries in the world. Uh, I'm sure some of the people on the panel can tell you better than I. And the regulations are built with the assumption that you have custodians, you have central entities, people you trust. You, and you look at other things like personally identifiable information or uh, the whole notion of identity. Uh, generally, you have a custodian. Okay, so our trust model is I have a broker. Let's say it's Bob, and he controls something I own. So the regulator says, I'm going to treat Bob very harshly. I'm going to demand Bob do KYC, let's know your customer, or anti-money laundering, or file special reports. I'm going to tell Bob to tattle on you if you're a naughty person, whatever that may be. And the challenge with that is that this technology makes everybody Bob. Your phone is now a bank, and it's in your pocket. And your phone is now a credential management system, and a file sharing system. And million other things. So regulation necessarily has now a huge gap. And we live in a world of prosecutorial discretion as business owners, in that the prosecutor now has the freedom to arbitrarily decide to enforce, if desired, statutes that have really no bearing on reality, and they can enforce these things very harshly. As a kind of canonical example, US tax law is a great example. Uh, so Tax law was not designed for something like Bitcoin, and the current interpretation is it's kind of like a baseball card. It's an asset. What does that mean? Well, it means that every single time you receive a Bitcoin payment, that's like ordinary income. And you should, that's a capital gain. You have to, to go ahead and pay your taxes on that, regardless of whether this asset is liquid or not. So let's say you create a cryptocurrency, we'll call it FooCoin or something like that, okay? and you claim FooCoin is worth a million dollars. No one buys it, but let's say it's worth a million dollars. And so you, you, you get 500,000 FooCoin, you send it to your friend. Well, guess what? You just now have a, a tax burden. Uh, in the United States would be about 40%, so that's about $200,000 you owe to the IRS as ordinary income. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, you can't sell it, you can't realize it, but you owe the taxes up front. Now let's say the next day of trading volume, the value of FooCoin goes to $1. So you have had a $999,000 loss in market capitalization. So you'd say, oh, well, I can deduct it from my taxes, right? I was like, well, no, only 5,000 per year or something like that. But don't worry, one day you'll catch up. I guess, I guess Trump will too. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's just a great example of where tax law doesn't accept reality. And there's securities laws, there's regulations for terrorist financing, and that's just kind of in the FinTech sector. But then when you move into other businesses like uh, custodial businesses of data or assets where we have all these privacy regulations or other things, uh, again, you're in very unstable ground. Uh, so as an entrepreneur, your question was, has this affected my business? And the answer is, yeah, kinda, in that I don't do business in the United States. Uh, I'm in 10 countries, but, and my headquarters is in Hong Kong, but we actually don't have a US branch at the moment. And if we were to do um, US operations, it would be done in a very scoped way. Um, so that's, that's the first way it's affected us. The second way it's affected us is that, you know, effectively when you pay your taxes or you do any of these things, you're just kind of rolling the dice. Because it's a situation where both sides of the equation, nobody actually knows what to do or what to say. For example, in Hong Kong, every year you have to go through an audit. And uh, your auditor looks at your records 
And, uh, and when we told them about Bitcoin transactions we had on our books, they said, yes, 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 but you know, tell us which bank and print out the transactions and so forth. And we're like, I don't think that means what you think it means. <laughs> and so this has been a constant problem. And it's just like when we moved from uh, the paper-based economy to the internet economy, how things tremendously changed. So the hope is that we'll eventually we'll get it sorted out. Uh, the dystopian component of it is that people are going to try to centralize and control it and regulate it in ways that we wouldn't like. But just like BitTorrent taught the music industry, sometimes technology is a little bit stronger than any one regulator or any one law. Uh, you you like to? Just a, a, I thought that was an excellent overview. Um, to really put a point on some of the issues we have in the US with regard to uh, the regulator expecting a custodial With the regulator expecting a custodial intermediary who will be the point person for any regulatory pressure the government wants to apply to the system, um, one of the biggest issues we have in the U.S. is with regards to consumer protection regulation. So as, as Charles just said, everybody now potentially has a bank in their pocket. Now who's guaranteeing the solvency of that bank? Now of course we know in, in, in the Bitcoin context, for example, there's a blockchain that is, that is maintained by unaffiliated persons all over the world and that's what record your your phone is querying but there's also software on your phone which could have vulnerabilities and things like that but even just explaining any of this to somebody who regulates uh, a normal bank or a normal money transmitter for the purposes of guaranteeing solvency and consumer protections is very difficult and in the US we have a, a compounded problem than in the rest of the world in that this prudential regulation is done state by state actually so in order to operate in the US as a money transmitter, as somebody who might hold somebody else's money, you're going to have to go to every state where you might have customers and not just check in with them. This is licensing. This is, you can't do this until you get our per permission. And if you were doing this for a while without our permission, you're on the hook for fairly substantial criminal penalties, both at the state and federal level. And the big difficulty here is there are some businesses in this space who are like exchanges. Um, Coinbase, Poloniex, Kraken, companies where there's actually an obvious moment where they do take custody of some user's cryptocurrency. They act like a Bitcoin bank, if you will. And it makes sense for those companies to fit into the same legal frameworks as existing custodial institutions. Well, nobody's arguing for special treatment here. A Coinbase, if they hold your Bitcoin, should be treated like a Bank of America if they hold any kind of assets for you. There's some catches here because they're not doing fractional reserve lending, but at the end of the day, they do have a sort of solvency risk or a sort of risk that they don't secure the things that you're having them secure. If you're Coinbase or you're an exchange, you go state by state and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be moving money for people and I'm gonna hold it for them in a transitory sense at least. Can I get a license? And they say, you're what and you do what? <laughs> and then you say, well, let me explain. And then at the end of the conversation, hopefully they say, okay, well, this is how maybe you can fit into our, our, our licensing framework. But more likely in a lot of cases, and this is what's happened over the last few years, they'll say, I I'm sorry, I'm not gonna give you a license. And then you say, so you mean I, I, I don't need to have a license because of the way my business model is? And they said, no, I didn't say that either. <laughs> and so basically they're saying you can't operate in the state, or if you do, you're taking this massive risk, as Charles described, where you're just in this gray area, and any day they could come in the future, knock on your door and say, you were transmitting money for the last two years without a license. And that's five years uh, uh, in jail, potentially, for you, your investors. This law applies to shareholders, actually, and your management team which will of course then just be leveraged for a massive monetary settlement. And then do that once and repeat 50 times because we've got 50 states. And then it gets even worse, just to put a, put a point on it, if you are not a, an exchange that's holding other people's cryptocurrency for them, you're a software developer who's creating a new cryptocurrency that once it runs will truly run potentially in a decentralized environment where you are not holding other people's money. But what you did could be treated as money transmission because every state in the US defines it differently and usually defines it in fairly vague terms, something along the lines of money transmission for the purposes of licensing is defined as the transmission of money or monetary value. What does that mean? What, is that what a miner does? Not, not really, but maybe. Who knows? 
modulo 50, 50 again. <laughs> and would that be another offense if you do it without a license? So, so would you get an infinite regress of uh, <laughs> <laughs> punishment? <laughs> Dara, you own it. And then, and, then, and then you. Yeah, Dara. I just want to add that one of the great benefits of uh, the code is law idea is that uh, you know, once, you, once you have these conversations with regulatory bodies, you can codify the regulations in code and have libraries so that if you're operating in the United States and you need to follow some regulations, you just import that library and uh, you know, wrap everything in the appropriate function or whatever. And all of a sudden, you're automatically code compliant. Uh, which, you know, so if, if we eventually uh, figure out the regulatory side of this, you know, how to get them to understand what blockchains are and stuff, uh, it could become very, very easy to do this stuff without any uh, issues. All right, so opening the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, let's go ahead. Okay, so I have a question, because from what you said, uh, it's that I'm, uh, if I have a Bitcoin wallet, and I'm operating, for example, in Greece, then I'm out of custody of Uni United States, and I can do whatever I want, yes or not? If I'm... Uh, if uh, my customers are in the US because they can be whatever they, they want because only thing that identifies them is the public key. So, a uh, first important disclaimer, I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I am a lawyer. Uh, but this is not legal advice for anybody listening. Um, so the issue, the issue specifically with US money transmission laws, it's based on wherever your customer is. If they're in the state of New York, then potentially, and New York actually has some very specific regulations now on this subject called the bit license, then you are supposedly subject to the bit license licensing requirements. Now, you say they're only identifiable by their public addresses. Of course, because we're using Bitcoin in this case. There's a problem with that. Um, there's no knowledge requirement in the statutes that make it a crime to be an unlicensed money transmitter. So if your customer was in New York, but you didn't know they were in New York, you still violated the statute and can be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law and without anyone proving that you had any knowledge of what you were doing. And I don't think there's a de minimis clause. And there's no de minimis yeah. clause. So even if they move a fraction of a penny because it's a microtransaction for Wi-Fi, you know, a great idea. Nope. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those areas where the US is, is really lagging from an innovation standpoint. And it should be, in some ways, maybe exciting or heartening to, to all of you here that the future of innovation may not be in Silicon Valley anymore. That was, that was a decent place to, 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 to be an entrepreneur in the space back when the laws on the table were mostly in regards to speech, an area where US law is fairly hands off because of our First Amendment. But when things start having to do with finances, with money, US is fairly draconian with the hand they take on regulation, sometimes deliberately because of anti-terrorism, uh, the financial surveillance laws, and sometimes inadvertently because of the nature of our federalist system, which has created this 50-state money transmission regulation. That, that law, by, by way of example, it, similar to the law where you have to stand with a flag in front of a car, was originally started because if you didn't have a bank account and you got a, a, a paycheck at the end of the working day in the 1970s, and you wanted to pay your utility bill, you'd walk into a random store and buy a money order. The person providing the money order, MoneyGram, Western Union, or some other company we've never heard of, they're gonna give it to you, you're gonna hopefully cash it with, the, with your utility provider, and hopefully when you take it to your utility provider and they cash it, it doesn't bounce. If it bounces, then this person who sold you the money order, the money transmitter, just, you know, they screwed you. And so these state-by-state state regulations were originally set up to make sure that the people providing these money transmission service in that state were all licensed and they weren't people who were gonna try and screw people. Um, but things have changed a lot since the day of money orders that you actually walk into a store and physically obtain. But these laws still apply. Yeah, and just as a follow-on real briefly, um, you say, well, we're in Europe, when it's not Asia. Just because you live outside of the United States does not mean that you're in some way uh, insulated from U.S. law. The reality of the United States is, uh, has an outsized geopolitical influence, and they express that via treaties. So they have securities treaties, tax treaties with many, 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 many countries. I think almost every European country, if not all of them, and most 
countries one would do business in or live in. And these treaties are set up in a way that if you violate U.S. law, you could be subject to extradition or prosecution or fines. So you have to take U.S. law into consideration. The other thing is that's, that's the hard power. The soft power is that U.S. policy tends to greatly influence policy for most developed nations. So for example, in Japan, uh, what usually ends up happening is they tend to lag U.S. policy. And they say, what's the European Union and uh, the United States doing? They have a big argument about it for a while. And then they say, well, OK, let's just do what the United States is doing. <laughs> you know, and it's the same in China in many, many, many respects for, for several things. Uh, whether these are actually properly enforced or not, and you know, the, how much gray area is permitted in the culture, that's a, that's a country by country basis. But it is important to understand that even, even though I, you know, I, I'm an American and you know, Paul is, is also, and we have a kind of a US perspective in the way we look at things, a US perspective does become a pseudo global perspective from both a soft and a hard perspective. That's a very quick question. There was some argument some months ago about um, public, uh, well, uh, government documents speaking about Bitcoin as not a currency but as a commodity. So it would be liable to taxation as a commodity. What has happened with this? You want to take that one? So in the US, um, the, IRS, the IRS treats Bitcoin as property. And Charles was starting to describe some of the issues that surround that. Um, that is still a current um, classification. Another issue from the, the standpoint of it being a transactional medium of exchange and a, and a vibrant thing that could work as a currency, um, because you're subject to capital gains and losses, um, you have to reaccount every time you have a transaction. So if you were using Bitcoin that you had originally purchased in 2012 to buy a fraction of that Bitcoin, to buy a stick of gum, you've encountered a taxable event because you bought a whole lot more gum with that fraction of a Bitcoin than you could have in 2012 because the price of Bitcoin has changed so aggressively. Now, if every time you have a small transaction, you have to calculate an account basis and figure out whether it was whether you're going to do your accounting for via uh, you know first in last out or last in last out or all of this and talk to a tax attorney because you wanted to buy a stick of gum it's not going to work as a functioning currency now maybe you could just ignore that and that's what i think a lot of people do is they just ignore their their some of their tax obligations with respect to this technology because it's too complicated to account for well then you're actually in violation of of, of the tax code and there's a lot of um, interest about this right now because uh, the IRS has started somewhat more aggressively looking for information related to Bitcoin balances that people are holding um, on exchanges like Coinbase, for example. They've issued a subpoena to Coinbase for all data related to all of Coinbase's users who were transacting in Bitcoin, I think, between the years 2012 and 2015. Uh, that's over a million people in a John Doe summons. In other words, no one's even named in this request for information. It's just anybody who fits into that category. It's a massive, massive attempt to sweep up a lot of financial information about people under the assumption that, well, they must be doing something wrong because it's so easy to do things wrong with Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, I guess a follow-up would just be classification. So if you say it's a currency, there's a regulatory body that's responsible for that. If you say it's a commodity, is a regulatory body that's responsible for that. You can inductively go down the list. So one of the biggest problems when you have an ambiguous asset is who is exactly responsible for regulating you? That's another problem as a business owner, you know, because when I, I hold something, I'd like to know what bucket it lives in, what are the rules? So you can follow the rules. But when it lives in seven buckets and the people who own those buckets disagree about that, and they all happen to be part of the Treasury Department, which makes it even more Kafka-esque, uh, that's, a, that's a persistent problem. So I wouldn't be surprised that CFTC is trying to claim it's commodity-like. And to be fair, it's more like a commodity, in my view, Bitcoin, than a currency. Uh, yeah, I'd say it's like digital gold or something like that. It behaves that way. Yeah, none of these classifications are, are by, necess by necessity exclusive. You exactly. can fall into multiple, multiple classifications simultaneously within the same jurisdiction. Another good old story from early technological innovation and, and regulation is something that I refer to as the Space Invaders case. There was a pub in England 
that was very excited to get one of the first arcade boxes for Space Invaders. And then the local um, city council member came in and found a way to charge them with being a, a, a public cinemata cinematographic display, which was the, the word for being a movie theater in the regulator speak of the day. And for being a movie theater, you had to have all sorts of important fire safety um, compliance measures, chief among them the fact that the film is very flammable, which of course at that point in history, the film no longer even was flammable. Original celluloid was. It was explosive. And this is an arcade. Uh, game in a, in, a, in a bar. And the judge eventually, because some British judges are actually quite enlightened, threw this out. But this had to be a whole fight, basically. Ar is every bar with an arcade game now a movie theater? So, um, just picking it up now from a broader uh, perspective, like you, you pointed out a lot of like inefficiencies or incompatibilities with existing uh, frameworks. Uh, and it appears uh, that uh, countries that with uh, well-established uh, um, social institutions and infrastructures are, are the ones that uh, also may seem to be the hardest to penetrate in some sense for this type of new technology. But also you hinted that this can be also an opportunity, like smaller countries, uh, countries that can actually have the ability to push policy, which is um, uh, cryptocurrency and smart contract friendly, can actually have an edge in, in innovation. And, and given that we are here in Greece, uh, uh, Greece that uh, in the last few years uh, is uh, being hit very hard from a uh, global financial crisis, uh, this could be also a message uh, that, uh, that uh, our, our discussion can also uh, provide. So do you have any, so suppose like, you know, you were given like, and this is a question also open to the, to the whole audience, you're given like the ability to have direct access to policy regulators and you could actually change things. Uh, you, you could change things to make them flexible and give uh, and provide a framework uh, that uh, could legally make it more um, easy for people to innovate uh, in, the, um, in, a, in a jurisdictional area, like in a small country like Greece. Do you have any, any ideas or any suggestions or anything that could be done from your experience in, 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 in working on the area that, uh, let's say, people in the audience could be inspired about and um, uh, present to uh, people they know, either here or, of course, in other countries uh, similarly? Any, any comments? Um, one, of, one of our chief initiatives right now will be getting uh, legislation in the U.S., which I'm giggling because fortunately legislation in the U.S. is a very difficult thing to, to move um, uh, and, and certainly no better in the current state of politics in the U.S. But um, legislation that would create a safe harbor for non-custodial uses of the technology. And what I mean specifically by that is if you're a Bitcoin bank, you're an exchange that holds other people's funds, then as I said, we're not gonna argue for special treatment. We're not gonna ask that you not comply with the same regulations that PayPal or Venmo has to comply with other tech companies that hold other people's funds. But if you're developing software, if you're developing technology or are adding uh, network capabilities or infrastructure, and if you as a business do not actually hold a big, you know, basically pot of people's funds, then what you're doing should never be regulated in the same prudential consumer protection way that a bank is regulated. Now you may be subject to unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Your app didn't look exactly like what it did. It didn't do what it said on the tin. We're gonna sue you after the fact. But it, that's a very different type of regulation than you're not allowed to engage in this behavior until you're a chartered bank or a licensed money transmitter. So I think it's very fair to require licensor, licensure or charters from people who are gonna hold other people's money, but for people who are just writing software that allow people to hold their own funds on their own device, so a software wallet, potentially even a multi-sig wallet, potentially uh, a, a piece of infrastructure like the, the payment channels that were described earlier and maybe the, the payment channels linked up in the form of the Lightning Network or, or something like that. If you're building the software that does any of those things, or providing the, the, the non-trusted or low-trust network capacity, the people who are the miners, the people who are the full nodes relaying transactions, all of those activities 
could potentially fall into the definition of the category of things that we require people to get licensed or chartered to do, because those definitions are too broad. They're like the de definition of cinemagraphic display in that old British statute. But what we need is for it to be done through law, or if it can be done through regulation in other countries, a clear statement that those activities exist in a safe harbor. Those activities are not banking. They are not money transmission. Because the software design and the provision of the public good that is the network infrastructure, that's where the true innovation of this technology is. Now sure, it's still very innovative to run a business that holds other people's cryptographic assets, but the real fundamental change I think comes when these new networks emerge as public goods and they emerge because people developed the software and provided the, the network throughput in ways that were not custodial. A jubilee for, for regulation? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, my experience uh, uh, from this, well, first off, you have to understand that not everything should be solved uh, with a law, and not everything should be solved with an existing regulation. Uh, when we did Ethereum, uh, the first thing that we attempted to do, and it was successful, was work with a law firm in uh, Switzerland to create a self-regulatory organization for Bitcoin. Um, this is what Luca Miller did with MME Partners. And they put a heck of a lot of work. Uh, they put a heck of a lot of work uh, with uh, with that effort. But basically, the idea was that the government probably is not going to care about an industry that's under a billion dollars. That really is is the provenance of cypherpunks and nerds. That's the first proposition. The second proposition is that there is a fledgling industry where they all have a common interest. And and the third is that there is a potential that this thing could get big over an arc of time. So having that notion, they were able to actually create something. And then once you've created it, you have a sandbox for standards. Uh, what people have to understand is regulators are human beings too. Governments are run by human beings. And if you approach them and say, everything you've done is wrong, you're stupid, you can't understand my industry, and I'm just gonna go do my own thing and you can't stop me, neener, neener, um, <laughs> that's gonna result in them getting pretty upset and then saying, no, no, not only are we going to stop you, we're going to use the power of the state to stop you. And in a very Thomas Hobbes way. So that's, that's not so good. Uh, so instead what you have to do is kind of, like, it's almost like fishing. You give them, a, give them some bait. You say, hey, I have this beautiful sandbox right here. You can play in the sandbox, and as long as you're in the box, you can do anything you want, and that'll give you a tremendous influence over outcomes. And once they understand that, then they say, okay, maybe we can have a conversation. Some governments are willing to say yes to that. Some governments are saying absolutely not. But in general, that model is at least reasonable. Now, what's exciting about smart contracts, and, I, and something I've learned from being in the space, is that that sandbox is not run by people. That sandbox can actually be built into a protocol and composed of software. That's what gets me super, super, super excited about this. As Daryl was saying, and maybe we'll elaborate more, uh, is that you can say, okay, Thailand, you know, let's say you're talking about gambling regulation. What taxes would you like to have? What does provable fairness mean to you? What types of games are allowed and aren't allowed? And okay, let's write smart contracts to actually construct the, the underbelly of that entire schema. Then what you can do is say, okay, for anybody gambling in Thailand, to do it legally, they must use this pipe. And all Thailand has to do is check off on it. It's kind of like uh, the cryptography you were talking about, the standards uh, a little, little back, and to say, well, a committee of experts could define this. Well, a committee, a, a government committee could define what's a proper contract. A guy like Daryl can write it. We can create some formal proofs of correctness for it. And now we have a sandbox, and we have a module to make gambling legal in that context. Now, is that gonna be legal in the United States? No. So then you can go to the US regulator and say, hey, it works in Thailand. They're making money from it. It's provably fair. There's good outcomes being produced. You have AML potentially inside this thing. You're, you're breaking up all the, the dark elements of the space. Would you also like to do this? And even if they say no, what can happen is a guy like Paul can have a hypothetical conversation with them and say, if you were to allow this to happen, what would it look like? And they don't have to make a commitment. And so then you can construct that. 
then when going to your idea about a jubilee, you can say, well, maybe in a certain area we could run an experiment. You like this idea, maybe this zone right here, let's say you're China and Shanghai or Macau or something like that, you now have a special economic zone, we're gonna run the experiment for five years and collect real data. Again, the risk is bounded, it's low, they've had consent, they've had a chance to build whatever sandcastle they wanted in the sandbox. Now, this to me is actually extremely exciting from a, a regulatory standpoint because you have something that can be done as a library you can be done very quickly. You have something that doesn't require you to violate the underlying principles of the protocol. For example, you don't have to build KYC and AML into Bitcoin itself. That's not something that globally affects the users. It's more of a consent system saying if you want to do action or activity X, you use pipeline Y, and then you're in this regulated sandbox to do that kind of a thing. And that sandbox has actually been designed in a public-private partnership. And you can run experiments on it, collect data, and it's also intrinsically competitive, which is something that just blows me out of the, the water, is that you can get real data across many different countries and see where the outcomes are good and where the outcomes are bad. So uh, I think there's a unique opportunity for us as a community to, to approach it from this direction. I think if we approach it from the cypherpunk direction, we're gonna get clobbered, because uh, these industries are very large, they're very well established, and they kind of own the deck. It's, and they own the casino, so it's, it's not a fair game in that respect. But there is one caveat I'd like to point out. You know, we, we often tout the power of our tools, but to be frank, the cryptocurrency space governance as a whole is a mess. You know, Bitcoin is a mess. These guys can't even agree on a goddamn parameter, excuse my language, but they just can't. For years, we've been fighting about simple things. So you cannot go and say, this is going to change governments, this is going to change uh, the whole notion of, of our relationship with money and other things when we can't even get simple things done. So I think we do need to do a lot more basic research into making decisions in a decentralized system, uh, a lot more research into figuring out how to uh, reach consensus in a social setting. We solved it in the formal setting, in the machine setting. We get machines to agree in consensus, but on a social setting, we haven't quite solved that problem. And until we do that, um, I don't think these systems are particularly useful for running companies or particularly useful for running governments or other things. That's my caveat I put to the first thing of the sandboxing, which I think is very valuable. But until we solve the government, uh, it's, uh, it's not useful. I just want to add, uh, regarding the sandbox idea, I just want to add regarding the sandbox idea. Um, again, because all of this is in software, uh, and especially because it's public, or at least blockchains are public, um, you can retroactively run experiments and say, look, if you had these regulations in place, here's what would have happened. You know, you would have generated, you know, a hundred million dollars in tax revenue or something like this, uh, which makes it possible to go to regulators and say to them, you know, hey, look. This would actually benefit you greatly. Here's the uh, here's the outcome that would have happened, and uh, you can just take it from there. You know, you don't even have to necessarily run real-world experiments. You can sort of show them what would have happened, uh, which you can't really do uh, by relying on uh, sort of the normal real-world currency sort of things. You know, I mean, you know, who are you going to go uh, to <laughs> to say, oh, let me see what your books are? Uh, and let's calculate the tax revenue you would have done if this was all legitimate and above board. Uh, that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, more questions from the audience? All right. Rafael. Um, I have a question uh, about the legal aspects of uh, public key cryptography, actually. Uh, I, it's more connected to the talk of uh, Christoph Sorge, and I would like to ask um, how could we go about uh, um, uniting private keys with uh, specific persons? And uh, would that be desirable? Because you, you touched that uh, point from a legal point of view. So uh, I'm not sure if I get your question. So at the moment, this is done via certificates, um, and there are certification authorities which have to meet uh, certain criteria to make sure the, the mapping is actually secure and the um, certification authorities' private keys are not uh, going to some attacker. Uh, sorry, is, is 
that what you mean? Uh, what the problems are with the current regulation? Or um, just to make sure I get your question right. The question is how, from a technical, uh, from a practical point of view, we could uh, um, say that this person has this uh, has a, pi a private key that only he owns, and that corresponds to that known public key. Mm -hmm. And uh, would we like that to happen? For example, having a, with our birth, birth certificate a special private key, a private public key pair generated and given to us from birth and using it to pay our taxes or something. Okay, so, so there are uh, quite um, s some extremes possible as a solution. So for example, um, in some countries there are electronic identity cards. Uh, the German electronic identity card has everything that you need. Um, so it has um, your identity and it has the possibility to generate signatures on that identity card. Um, except that they make you jump through a lot of hoops to actually use that, um, but that would be one way. So every citizen would just get that key pair um, from the authority that also issues the passports, uh, which would, I think, be the, the ideal solution, except that it doesn't work the way it's implemented in Germany, but um, there is someone who can identify you and he could give you the public key and the certificate uh, confirming that it's actually your public key. Another issue with that is, is our identity is really a multifaceted concept, and we get it from federated sources. So we, we get our identity from our government, potentially, in some regards, but also from the private institutions we've attended, our schools. Um, we might get it in the US because we wanted to drive a car, and this is not just an identity token. It's not, you don't just use it to prove you're over 18 at a bar. You use it also to prove that you went through whatever training is necessary to drive the car. So it's like a bundle of entitlements that we carry around with us in our wallets. The entitlement to use a bank account, the entitlement to spend some funds, the entitlement to, to drive, the entitlement to say that you are a, 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 a JD who's got a legal background and might be able to give legal advice, but not, not to you. Um, in, in, in this world, it, it's, 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 I don't think, there's technical reasons to not want one private key correspond to your full digital identity because basically private keys get stolen, private keys get lost, they get destroyed. And once they're out in the public, they're useless. Anyone can then impersonate you. Um, the idea of building a, a, a federated identity system using blockchain technology is I think very interesting. So this is in some ways what the certificate authorities already do, that it's a federated system of proving that, you know, people are who they are for various purposes, or, or IP addresses are, you know, owned by, they're on, at servers owned by Google, or any number of things. Now, the problem with that system as it currently exists, to some extent, is that we rely on a handful of centralized institutions to maintain those mapping relationships between an IP address and Google.com, or between uh, a, a certificate, HTTPS certificate you get from your bank when you do online banking, and the actual bank so that someone can't spoof, spoof you and convince you that you're visiting Bank of America's website when you're actually visiting a scammer. Um, this is one of the things that's very exciting with blockchain technology is we potentially have the possibility of building architectures which can create these mapping relationships between any number of attributes a person might have and a person and distribute them across, uh, uh, across the world through a blockchain distributed to, to every node on the network, and so we don't have to rely on the, on the viability and availability of a centralized server. Additionally, if, if, if things are device sovereign or user sovereign, we have this risk of you know, non-sophisticated people losing their device. Like what happens if you lose your, your car uh, in, in, the, in the German ID context is, is I would imagine, a problem with a headache that has certain bureaucratic processes to resolve it that are fairly imperfect right now. It would be even worse in a, in a you know, cypherpunk future where everybody owns everything that they own on their phone and then what happens if you lose your phone, you lost yourself. Um, there are some exciting advances in this area on the blockchain technology front in the form of, say, uh, multi-sig technology. So um, Dionysus explained um, what transactions look like and you can, do, uh, you can do Bitcoin transactions that will actually require multiple 
public, uh, multiple private keys to sign before the transaction is valid on the network. A cool implementation of this for identity would be if I have an identity wallet of sorts, I have maybe one of three keys related to that identity wallet. Um, if somebody steals my phone, they don't, they don't steal the ability to sign for, for me. There is another party out there that's tracking my movements as a private corporation that I pay to do fraud protection and theft protection for my device, that as long as I'm, I seem to be doing the things I normally do in my life, I'm, I visited Athens, but I told them in advance I was gonna visit Athens, they'll sign the second key when my phone device broadcasts a, re a request to broadcast a transaction, basically. And then two of three keys being necessary to sign, at that point I can prove my identity. What's interesting here, as compared to, say, the credit card fraud context, is that if the, if the verifying provider in this case disappears, the person who's doing the fraud protection disappears, I'm not necessarily out of luck, in the sense that I'd be out of luck if Visa got hacked or disappeared. Um, because let's say the third key in this situation is something I've entrusted with a dear and close friend for the purposes of disaster recovery. Then I go find my dear and good friend, convince them that the company that was doing fraud protection for my identity has gone out of business or gone offline, and then they and I sign a transaction to move the capability of spending those credentials, if you will, or proving those identity credentials to another device. And th th this technology already exists in its, in its, its, ad uh, in its, uh, in its very young stage in the form of just a multi-sig Bitcoin wallet, something that like a company like BitGo provides right now, where you basically do have the funds the funds exist because of private keys you hold on your device and elsewhere, but there's never enough keys on any one device to actually initiate a transaction. So this risk of um, consumer error starts to disappear. That, that, that's an interesting, a very interesting you know, framework for future identity systems, I'd say. Um, yeah, very, very quickly. I mean, in a, to a certain extent, we do this as credit cards who typically run a fraud detection monitoring system uh, be behind it. And, uh, um, well, one disadvantage is they sometimes simply disappear for a short moment of time from the air, which wouldn't be a problem here. I still remember when I got my first permanent job in Edinburgh. And, um, oh yeah, no, that's the other thing. Uh, in order to work, sorry, they have to obviously know you. They really have to profile you. They need to know as much about you as possible. So from a privacy and data protection perspective, they are one of these big dangerous things. And also because they operate under an assumption that our works, uh, our lives are very, very stable. And that becomes almost self-reinforcing. If I need to live a stable life, because otherwise my credit card company refuses the transactions, then lots of choices that I at the moment still can make become impossible. And the story I want to tell you are two, two quick stories. Uh, when I finally got my, 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 my permanent contract in Edinburgh after, after a couple of years, I, I took my uh, then girlfriend, now wife, out to a really, really good restaurant, Kitchens, best restaurant in Edinburgh, really expensive. Uh, I didn't know at that time yet how expensive and how much money I was actually going to get uh, uh, from, from my university. Otherwise, I might have, I might have reconsidered. But uh, uh, anyway, I tried to pay with my credit card, and it was promptly denied. Um, not only was this hugely embarrassing for me that I wasn't able to make this transaction, uh, if my wife had known more about the profiling, she would also have said, well, actually, Burkhard, it's not just that uh, uh, you now need to have to leave your, your watch behind and you might have to do some washing up for them. Uh, it also means the computer knows you're a cheapskate. <laughs> you do not normally take people out for dinner. And I might have to reconsider our uh, arrangements here. So, so. Um, if you do that, then there will be someone who knows quite a lot about you and will leak that inevitably uh, uh, to others and will reinforce the need that you comply with a very stable, consistent, very boring way of living life uh, that doesn't have quite the variety available at the moment that we have. Whenever you talk about identity, at least in, in my untrained mind, uh, it, the single most important thing is not how do you link some sort of cryptographic credential to the name. So not how do we connect John Smith to a particular public key. It's actually revocation. So what happens when you have to delink that or move it, rotate it to something else? That's a tremendously more involved question and blockchain technology doesn't actually have a prescription for that. It gives you a nice place to stick the credential, 
that's immutable and it's tamper resistant and it's time stamped and you have all these great properties about storage. But the actual revocation scheme, you, you, you need a guy like Agalos to, to think really, really hard about how to do that properly. The other thing is, why do we care about identity? So we, we always talk like identity, 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 right? We want identity, but you care about metadata about identity. You, no one would really care about Charles Hoskinson. You care about, well, who is Charles Hoskinson? How old is he? What has he done? What are the things? Because that gives you the notion of reputation. That's, that's the, the point of identity. You know, it's like when the NSA said, oh, well, we don't collect data, we just collect the metadata. Well, it's like, guys, that's the thing that matters, right? Because that's, that's the thing about the thing. And so th the other question is, um, how do you build a reputation system with these types of things? And you have to be very careful about that. Because there is actually a dystopian road that you can go down if you're, if you're not careful. And China is leading the way with this whole My Citizen Score concept that they've been prototyping. So imagine you live in a world where they gamify how good of a citizen you are of a particular country. And that's defined, good is defined by whoever happens to be in power at the time. So imagine the United States with Donald Trump or pick your favorite politician, and he gets to decide if, you know, what activity deducts from your score and what activity uh, increases your score. And what are the practical consequences? If your score goes too low, your passport gets revoked. Your tax rates go up. You lose your license to practice law or to practice medicine, whatever it may be. Now, you know, the totalitarian regimes have always done this, but they've done it in piecemeal because they've never had a framework or technology in their back pocket that would allow them to do it in a very systematic way. So usually what they do is they gulag somebody as an example, create a culture of fear and hope that that enforces the desired behavior. Now what you could do is create a credential system that's immutable, unauditable, uh, always auditable, excuse me, and so it's not manipulatable, and then you have all the metadata there, so no one can change that, and then they can create any metric that you'd want to either make you a good citizen or a bad citizen. So privacy is incredibly important in these types of things, and revocation is incredibly important in these types of things. And before we go into a rush to start digitizing identity, because really it does give you a lot. I mean, you get rid of passwords on the internet, and your, your e-commerce gets so much more secure. There's a lot of magic that multi-sig and other things give you. You have to also understand the, the other side of the token, that if this is not done right, you have just created uh, basically 1984 on steroids. Um, that's very that's very interesting. And um, as we as we build the future based on, on blockchains, maybe we should think about alternative ways of formulating identity that maybe uh, protects us against such constructions. And I guess one of the ways to do that would be to uh, decentralize identity verification. And maybe say, okay, right now identity is a country. It's a government that is the issuing authority for a passport. But perhaps. That shouldn't be the case. Maybe we should have a sort of global citizenship, a, a world citizenship, where people can assert each other's well, humanness, I guess. And um, you, you could get an identity by people vouching for your existence. And then using that, maybe we, um, we can avoid such centralization issues. What do you think about that? There's an interesting project that exists already. Um, it's um, by the guys behind Blockstack, which is a broader tool. But uh, it was a website they created before called OneName. OneName is an interesting experiment in federated identity. Um, it's very difficult to get the network effects necessary to make an identity system work. There are a number of participants in the ecosystem who are already doing some form of identity solution, like Facebook, um, like Google Plus at the time when it still existed. All of these different services are 
dis discrete, they're separate. How do you knit them together and pro provide some evidence of weight? So one Facebook profile can easily be, you know, faked. But could you fake a Facebook profile and seven other profiles on the internet? Yes, you probably could still, but that you begin to understand the notion of probabilistic identity. So the very cool thing that, that one name did was allow you to sign a cryptographic proof, a message on Twitter, on GitHub, on Facebook, that you were in control of this account and reference those proofs in the Bitcoin blockchain as a sort of anchor or a meta identity. Whoever has this particular Bitcoin address has also signed proofs on these seven different centralized servers. It's a great experiment with the technology. It's certainly not ready for global prime time and it's certainly not necessarily private either. All of that data would then be public and you should never buy drugs on the dark web using your one name blockchain <laughs> address, I'll, I'll say that. And actually, knowing some blockchain analysis firms, people have done that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a very exciting um, uh, proof of concept, if you will, and, and maybe a way forward uh, knitting together our various different identity standards into sort of meta, meta profiles. So you want to write the proof of humanity paper now? Okay. Oh, yeah, question. So um, how can we create a worldwide database about everyone with their respective identities and anything that may be used without turning this into um, this dystopian uh, society worldwide or not? Uh, how can we achieve a balance between knowing enough to control but not control completely? How, how can this be achieved? Well, we already have a worldwide database. Facebook and what the NSA has in Bluffdale, you've got about three, four billion people covered there. Yes, but you don't necessarily use Facebook in order to uh, manage your transactions. Oh, but Facebook knows so much. They know who your friends are, they know your hobbies, your interests. Your favorite you pizza, yeah. <laughs> when you buy a watch, that's the first place you post a picture. When you buy a new car, what's the first place you post that? You have Facebook Messenger, you talk about your life and your comments and all those blocks of text can be parsed, archived, and you can apply machine learning to it. We even have a great platform for it. It's called Torch. It's developed in open source. So the question is not whether uh, will a database exist. The question is the database does exist. And now that it does, um, how do we create a framework that now protects our privacy and prevents governments from using what they know to hurt us? And that's a legal question. It's a social question. It's an ethical question. It's a computer science question. And uh, no one field, in my view, can solve that. I'd say that um, one of the essential um, components to the answer will likely be cryptography and the science behind technologies like Zcash. Um, so Zcash is an open source blockchain network, an open blockchain. Anyone can participate in the consensus. Uh, and it works rather like Bitcoin. In fact, they forked a lot of the code directly from the Bitcoin code base, um, but added in some interesting, unique cryptographic primitives, which basically allow the transaction to be ciphertext as far as anyone in the public is concerned, and yet still be verifiable by the miners on the network to say, not necessarily that we know that this person sent this much money to this person, that remains encrypted but to say that we know that in this transaction that we've just incorporated into the blockchain, we know that no new money was created. We've proved one discrete quality, quanti quality about, the, about the transaction without revealing the other information. This is ideally what we'd have for identity systems as well. Uh, it, would, it would involve technology similar to this that, that hopefully would be battle tested and we could rely on. Um, because right now the identity landscape is very poor. If you want to prove that you're over 21 to drink in a bar in the US, you show the bartender a card that has all of your personal information on it, your address, all sorts of things about you. That's not what this exchange should be about. This exchange in this case should be about one data point. This person is over 21. We don't need to know your name and your address or any other information about you, but we currently, as a kludge, use driver's license of all things in the US to prove our age. So ideally, there would be some sort of similar construction to a zero knowledge proof in the Zcash, in the Zcash context, 
where you can, with authority, and this is incredibly hard to build, I don't mean to say it's hard, hard to build, not hard to build, but with authority say, I am over, eight, I am over 21, I'm allowed to drink, without the bartender suddenly learning where you live. And without the public either learning where you live because the transaction was broadcast on an open network and everybody saw it when it hit the blockchain. Right. One, one last point, um, and that's, that's a great point, by the way, but one, one last point. You don't necessarily know ahead of time what should be private and not private. I think one of the greatest examples is in the fall of Iraq with the bath party. So for a long time, if you lived in Iraqi society, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party to do anything of reasonable value. It was an exclusive club, and if you wanted to hold a government position or go to the right schools or license, you say, oh, I'm a member of this party, this political party. So then, after the United States conquered Iraq, it, if you were a member of the party, you couldn't participate in anything. So you went from an identity landscape where you wanted to announce and declare in the most public way possible that you belong to a club. And then all of a sudden you live in an identity landscape where belonging to that club is now a liability. It's the exact same with Germany and the denazification. You're a member of the party during that time period, great opportunity. After that time period, you're trying to hide that, taking the uniform off, setting it on fire. Um, where the monkey wrench uh, comes into play is, is that with these blockchain systems that we're developing, they remember everything forever. Every single transaction that's ever occurred with, uh, with uh, Bitcoin has been permanently recorded, which is actually why I think Zcash is so incredibly important, because basically it's saying private by default, and you have to do something to make it not private. You have to declare that, and that's gonna be usually on a case-by-case -case basis, and Again, I, I think your point is very prescient. Maybe you can even do it in a way where you review the minimum amount of information possible to somebody, and perhaps even have some plausible deniability in that respect. That's another thing to consider with the nature of privacy in this new landscape is even you, the, the actor uh, who owns the data, the data's about, don't necessarily know, uh, you know what, what, what the privacy values should be. Especially if you're young and posting on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it, there's great examples of that about law school admission and medical school admission, where admissions counselors would actually uh, find pe on people's Facebook page patterns of underage drinking or illegal activity. And they'd have great GPA, they'd have great score on the MCATs or the LSATs, and they get rejected. And they'd say, well, why was I rejected? they say, well, you know, you're a very immature kid. Look at your Facebook page. And it's actually happened. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's ex absolutely true. One last question. So uh, you are saying that the database of our activities already exists, but at least now we know who calls them. If something wrong has happened, we can hold them accountable. And there are regulations like uh, the right to be forgotten. And uh, these regulations are not the best, but these are some things. With blockchain, you have a public ledger that nobody owns and uh, most importantly, nobody can uh, erase. And uh, I believe if uh, these things takes off, and if you have, for example, the IoT you mentioned, you know, uh, devices in our house recording every transaction in a public ledger, this is going to be a much bigger privacy threat than Facebook or Google. Well, I guess there's something to argue about transparency, where at the very least, you know, you know what's in the ledger, you know the ledger is going to be transparent and open, so you're inclined to only put information in that where you have a high degree of assurance it's going to stay private or you're comfortable with it being public. The problem with y the first part of your statement saying, well, we know who owns our data, that's actually not completely true. We know who aggregates our data. So we know Facebook has a large chunk and Google has a large chunk, but we don't know who they've sold it to. In fact, just recently, there's a legislative change in the United States, and if Trump signs it, it'll become the law of the land, which will allow ISPs to sell our web browser history. And they don't have to disclose uh, who, to whom they've sold that to. So uh, if you're gonna have these types of markets, it's probably better for them to be transparent instead of opaque, uh, is the first point. The other point is that um, you need better tools in general for people to be in control of who they share with, and for these things to expire in a certain respect. You know, uh, trust is not a Boolean characteristic where I trust you absolutely or I don't trust you at all. I think a buzz term in the PKI world for a while was trust agility, 
or I trust you kind of, sort of, and maybe on Tuesday, but not on Wednesday, or something like that. I'd like to be able to have customizable trust about things, and I would like to have revocation of trust. A greatest example of that is like revenge porn, or you know, all of these, these things that happen when you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and you like them at the time, and maybe you send them some pictures or text messages that at the time seemed like a good idea, and then after you break up, maybe that's not such a good idea. Wouldn't it be so great to be able to revoke these things? Um, unfortunately, that's still a tremendously hard problem. There are some ideas that maybe using techniques that were developed for DRM, uh, the trusted computing stuff, that we might be able to revoke access to these things, but it's still a tremendously difficult problem. But I think it's orthogonal to the, the whole question of whether it should be in a blockchain or a private database or not. There's, there's all kinds of debates about this. And at some point, there has to be some form of mutability. You can't have a situation where one immutable database stores all the information in the world for forever, regardless of how trivial. There's just not enough money or resources in the world to archive everything. So there will be pruning. It's just a question of how, when, and who gets to decide that, and uh, how much are you willing to pay to preserve things. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Yeah. Just one, one slightly tangential one, again, following your question and the example uh, that you gave about the teenagers uh, posting on Facebook. Right. There's definitely, obviously, a privacy problem. There's obviously a regulatory problem, but I don't think they will be the silver bullets. Um, part of it is also changing attitudes to that type of data. So for instance, I would say a um, university or an employer who bases decisions on that type of information is stupid and ultimately self-defeating because they don't realize that all the other people uh, they have a choice to employ could have created exactly such an embarrassing uh, page uh, had they been more computer literate or, or whatever, that the data probably applies to everyone else as well. And I think that's a problem we have a little bit with, you know, the um, rating websites. As soon as someone gets lots and lots and lots of ratings, then the data becomes almost useless because there will always be some people who have been unhappy and some people who have been happy and making a choice then becomes again really, really difficult. And I think we are moving with some of that personal data into that space. There is so much around about everyone that using it in a reasonable way as a, a starting point for decision making becomes more and more problematic. And I think quite a lot of rethinking has to take place on the side of the uh, data users in that sense, a case on how to make responsible and rational use of information that is in principle out there. That's a great point. It's just, uh, just I always love giving people a book to read. Um, there's a, a guy named Randy Farmer. Uh, he worked at Yahoo, and he also was uh, one of the architects behind the online game The Sims. And he wrote a book called Social Network Analysis or something like that. And he was responsible for creating rating systems for Yahoo and rating systems within The Sims. And he had a story of where there was something called the Sim Mafia. Where, you, where based on your reputation in the community, uh, real estate prices and rent would either go up or down. So people would blackmail people, saying that we'll give you bad ratings unless you give us money. And if we give you bad ratings, then everything gets too expensive and you can't play the game. And so there's a, a lovely YouTube video on it, and the book itself is, is quite good. But it, it parrots exactly what you're saying, which is there's a tremendous challenge in constructing these systems, and their usefulness is dubious. Okay. All right, so, well, the discussion will not uh, obviously finish today. <laughs> and that's a good thing. And I, and I hope that uh, the program of today's day and uh, the discussions that ensued during our panel were inspiring and uh, gave you food for thought and ideas about the uh, things you might pursue uh, in the near future. It's clearly like a lot of work that uh, still needs to be done in this area. Uh, but also, uh, I hope it also is clear that uh, there's a lot of potential and a huge impact uh, in the very near future. So um, please join me in uh, thanking um, uh, all our speakers for today and uh, panelists for this great. <laughs> Also, as a, as a final word, I would like to thank, of course, the European Research Council, which uh, very kindly provided the funding for all this research the last uh, six years, which we are uh, completing today. And 
respect to the today's uh, date, which uh, I hope again you, you enjoyed it. I would like to extend a special thanks to the organizing team, uh, which I will identify. First, uh, Dionysus Zindros, who is also like in the panel, like this Dionysus stand. Um, <laughs> And also the three researchers that I work with uh, here at the University of Athens, Spiros Haidos, Nikos Leonardos, and Katerina Samari, please stand. <laughs> so, uh, th thank you all for your help and for organizing with me this day. So, uh, last takeaway point, this is the website. Uh, many of you, most of you know it because you did a registration. It's still going to be uh, quite interesting to keep in mind the URL, all the material about today's uh, talk. Um, including uh, these talks, including uh, slides, including uh, uh, PowerPoint and uh, keynote presentations, uh, will be made available um, to the to the website, and we'll also uh, make available the videos from uh, from the talks, um, so you will have the chance to uh, review that material um, at your own leisure at some at some future time. So, thank you again very much for being here today. <laughs>